Richard Skipper celebrates. Every show is a celebration. Each show, Richard delivers the artists you love, showcasing what makes them unique. Never gossipy. The antidote to a sometimes hectic world. Now, here's your host, Richard Skipper. Happy Halloween, everybody, and welcome to Richard Skipper Celebrates. Now, tonight is my full moon positive book club. And this is the show that I do uh, every month on the positive, uh, on the full moon. Now, this is a very unique full moon. It's the second full moon of October this year. Uh, and when two full moons happen in the same month, the second full moon is traditionally called the blue moon. So once in a blue moon, here we are. Uh, also, it's a very unique blue moon because this, uh, well, a, a unique Halloween full moon because this is the first full moon that we have had on Halloween since 1946. But here we are. Now, each month on the full moon, I like to celebrate a book dealing with positivity. And the book that I chose for this month is How to Be Civil in an Uncivil World. Now, it's very interesting uh, because, uh, number one, uh, the first full moon, which was on October 1st, uh, my guest let me know the day before that she needed a new computer, the day before the show. And therefore, she would not be available to do that show with me, um, but she could try to do it on her phone. Now, the platform that I use is StreamYard. Uh, and I want to give a shout out to StreamYard because I absolutely love this platform. And so many other people are using this platform as well. As a matter of fact, uh, earlier uh, this month, uh, when they were having issues about the presidential debate, I thought that this would be the perfect platform to use because therefore we could bring people on or take them off as needed. And unfortunately, um, my guest on the first full moon of this month was not available to do the show. So we ended up canceling it. It wasn't such a bad thing because it gave me a night off. But the good news, bad news, depending on how you look at it, is that I ordered the book. Um, I don't ask for freebies when I do these books. I buy them, I pay for them, because I deserve, I believe that people deserve to be paid for their product. So I ordered the book, I read the book, I did my research, only to find out the night before the show that she was not going to be able to do the show. So we tried it with her phone, and she sounded like Minnie Mouse on helium. The image that she had, which would have been appropriate for Halloween, I guess, looked that, like she was at the bottom of a muddy well looking through. And it was just nothing that we could work with. So here we are again, second full moon of October. And tonight, my guest is supposed to be Cynthia Bassinet. As I said, she has this book, How to Be Civil in an Uncivil World. And I hope that she shows up. I bought the book. I've read the book. What is wonderful about the book is that it's all quotes and quotations uh, that she's put together. Um, daily things like, you know, I read them every morning. I've got my bookmark here and I'll read two of them. Life is the journey lived is one of them. And the other is stay strong with an open heart. So I am staying strong tonight with an open heart. She's not here. I'm here by myself. I hope that I'm entertaining enough for all of you who have tuned in. If you are fans and friends of Cynthia, uh, I hope that she shows up. If she doesn't show up, I'm going live and here I am on my own doing what I need to do. So I'll just talk about Halloween over the years in my life and hope that she shows up. Uh, if you have any comments or anything that you would like to 
uh, talk about or discuss or throw at me, by all means, uh, leave a comment in the comment section. And I will be glad to talk about anything that's on your mind. But of course, in keeping with tonight's theme, I'm going to remain civil and respectful of any topic that comes up tonight. So feel free to leave your comments here and we will talk about those things that are on your mind. If you would like to come on camera with me, send me a private message in the private message section. I'll bring you on and we'll talk about whatever is on your mind as well. And in the, in the meantime, we're doing this in hopes that Cynthia will still make it into the studio and we will be able to do a wonderful discussion, not only celebrating her book, but celebrating herself, Halloween, and anything else that comes up over the evening. Now, I will talk about my Halloweens growing up. Uh, I'm originally from Conway, South Carolina. Uh, those of you who follow my shows will know that. And uh, Halloween was a very special time for our family. My grandmother, uh, Getha Wallace Skipper, whose birthday is coming up uh, next week. Happy birthday, Grandma. Uh, she used to have a big silver bowl full of candy. And she used to sit by the front door and all the kids uh, from all around would come and she had more than enough candy uh, for everybody. And that candy that was not given away on Halloween would last through the rest of the holiday season, all the way through the end of the year. Um, Halloween and every holiday was very, very important to my grandmother Skipper. And I guess that that's where the idea for what I do comes from, celebration. It's all about celebrating life. It's about celebrating each other. And yes, I celebrate the holidays. This is very sad time this year because uh, of course, uh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And a lot of kids, if their parents are being careful with them, are not out trick-or-treating. Uh, where I live in Spark Hill, New York, which is a little hamlet, uh, which I call it the uh, elbow uh, of Piermont. Uh, I am just below Nyack, and I am very, very close uh, to Manhattan. I'm about 25 minutes north of Manhattan. And every year I buy lots of candy and I wait for the trick-or-treaters to come by. And on the average, if we're lucky, we will have between four or five trick-or-treaters. I keep hoping each year that it will increase, but that doesn't seem to be uh, the case. So if any of my Rockland friends are watching, have babies, so that in the future, I'm not eating so much candy on Halloween. But going back to my childhood, uh, we were not a wealthy family. Uh, we were uh, your average middle-class family. And so our parents did not invest a lot of money at Halloween uh, in costumes. Uh, so we were always wearing those plastic masks. And speaking, here is my mask for this evening. Happy Halloween. Don't leave home without your mask, but one that covers here. So every year on Halloween, uh, my parents would buy uh, a mask. Uh, they would come home and then me, my sister, my brothers, we would pick out the mask that we wanted to wear that Halloween. It didn't matter. Uh, they would have three masks for boys and they would have a mask for a girl, for my sister and for my brothers, and we would go trick-or-treating. And I remember one special uh, Halloween where we went to Charlotte, North Carolina uh, to visit my Uncle Parmalee and my Aunt Virginia. And it was an exciting time because it was a, one of those long Halloween weekends. And we started out by uh, going trick-or-treating uh, in their trailer park. Uh, the big thing that I remember from that Halloween is getting home and there was some weird smell that we had. And as we were going through our bags of candy, someone had tricked us and gave us a bag of raw onions. Uh, that was in the middle of all the candy. But the rest of the weekend, we went up to Banner Elk, North Carolina, in that area, uh, to Beach Mountain, and we went to Tweetsie Railroad, which was a big thing. 
And my Uncle Parmalee and my Aunt Virginia, every year when I was a kid, uh, at some point in the fall, normally, we would take that trip to uh, Asheville and the mountains of North Carolina to see the fall leaves change color. And it was a beauty to behold. And those memories stay with me all these many years later. And then I came to New York when I was 18 years old. And I discovered that Halloween had a whole different meaning here in New York. And I fell in love with Halloween uh, when I was in my 20s. I came to New York when I was 18. And every year on Halloween, uh, I would dress, believe it or not, as Carol Channing. Now, a lot of people have asked me over the years how I came to perform as Carol Channing. And while I'm waiting for Cynthia to hopefully arrive, I will begin to tell you the story. If we get interrupted by her arrival, and if you want to hear more, uh, feel free to call me, text me, email me, and I will fill you in on all the details. So my appearing as Carol Channing and my career really taking off for the years that I performed as Carol really began as a result of Halloween. Well, not exactly. When I first came to New York, um, I had been in New York, I guess, a year. I had moved to the Bronx. I was living uh, at 205th Street and Hull Avenue, very last stop on the D train. And uh, about a year into my life in New York, I was in the city one night and I went to Beefsteak Charlie's in the upper 60s uh, on uh, Broadway. And I discovered the piano bar. And that's what it was called, the piano bar. And at the piano was Houston All Red. And after going there for a few weeks, he finally encouraged me and got me uh, the confidence to get up and perform for the audience. And I did, and I got a great response. And I kept coming back uh, every Thursday night uh, was their Broadway night. And there was a buffet, which was free to all the people that would get up and perform. And when you are a starving artist in New York, at least in the 1980s, you discovered the places where you could find those free buffets. So I came in and I would go to the piano bar and I would have something to eat. And eventually Houston would get me up to perform. And this went on for quite some time. And then I had some friends that came to visit and uh, I got up and performed one Thursday night. I brought them to the piano bar and after I had gotten a great response. Houston said, you know, Richard, why don't you do a second song tonight? Which was unheard of, and it never, ever happened. But I was very excited. I got up and I said, well, I really don't have anything prepared. I always went with just the one song because normally that was the case. You only got the one song. So I came in, uh, I had nothing prepared, and my friend screamed, do Carol Channing. And he said, you do Carol Channing? And I says, no, 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 I don't do Carol Channing. Now let me back up a little bit more. When I was in high school, uh, someone dared me to do a lunchtime concert one day. So I went out on the front steps of Conway High School, which had these huge um, concrete steps that led up to the school. And it was almost like the stairway into the Harmonia Gardens. And I would get up there during the lunch break and I would do impressions of everything that I had seen on television the night before. And my introduction to Carol Channing came about from uh, the Lucy show. There's an episode with Lucille Ball and Ann Southern in which Lucy uh, pretending uh, to be, uh, a, uh, well, Ann Southern is pretending to be a spy. And to get onto the army base, Lucille Ball does an impression of Carol Channing. And I started doing my impression of Carol, of Lucille Ball doing Carol Channing, not realizing that Carol Channing was a real life person. So that's where it began for me. And I started doing that. And then I started seeing Carol Channing on other television specials. I saw the special that she did with Pearl Bailey. I saw her on the uh, Love Boat. I saw her on the Muppets. And I started combing the TV guide to see Carol Channing anytime she was going to appear on television. 
And that was my introduction to Carol. So my impression of Carol was really more Lucille Ball doing Carol Channing than it was me doing Carol Channing. So when my friends asked me to get up and perform as Carol Channing, I said, no, 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 I don't do that. But Houston O'Red uh, came and encouraged me to get up. And he said, do you know the Hello Dolly number? And I said, well, of course I know the Hello Dolly number. He said, no, I mean, do you know the number? Do you know the whole number? And I said, yes, of course I do. So he gets up and he starts staging the entire number. He starts grabbing uh, waiters that are there. He starts bringing guests up that are there. He brings everyone up and uh, he puts together a chorus line. And he begins to play Hello, Dolly. And for the first time, I got up and I performed in a piano bar as Dolly Levi, Carol Channing. And the response that I got was bigger than anything that I had ever experienced getting up performing in front of an audience. Um, and the entire audience, by the end of the number, was on their feet and they were cheering me. And there was a woman in the audience uh, named Leola Harlow. And Leola Harlow comes running over to me and she's, oh my God, I had no idea that you did this because I've been going there for weeks. And she said, you are phenomenal as Carol Channing. What's your drag name? And I didn't even know what that meant. I had never heard the word drag. Again, I grew up on a tobacco farm in South Carolina. I didn't know anything about this. And she said, well, obviously you perform as Carol Channing and I said, no, 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 I don't do this. And she said, well, I think you should. And if you ever decide to dress as Carol Channing, I want to dress you. You see, she was a seamstress and she did a lot of costumes for a lot of showgirls. And believe it or not, at that time, burlesque stars. I'm not talking about strippers. I'm talking about enthusiast, women who had a little flair with what they did. Not that strippers don't have a flair. I want to be civil about this. So anyway, I she kept trying to get me to dress as Carol. She even encouraged me to come to the piano bar dressed as Carol. And I had no desire uh, to ever do this. Well, it, it became a habit with the piano bar and Houston All Red. At the end of every evening that I was there, he would want to know if I could stick around and I would close the evening with Hello Dolly, with all the chorus boys and everyone in place. And we would recreate the Dolly number and the choreography to the best that I could do with my two left feet. And we would get up and perform. This went on for quite some time. And then I went to an audition for an off, 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 off Broadway show called All American Boy. And I walked into the audition, happy Halloween, I went into the audition and as soon as I walked in the door, one of the guys said, oh my God, you're Carol Channing. And my heart went up in my throat because I thought this is it. My career is over. This is not gonna happen. You know, they don't wanna see me. And it turned out that the second act of All American Boy found the leading characters going into a nightclub. And he said, I'm thinking out loud here. What if they walked into a famous drag club like Finocchio's, which was a very well-known San Francisco uh, drag club at the time. And he said, and what if the star attraction was a guy performing as Carol Channing? Therefore, you would not be playing Carol Channing in the show. You would be playing a drag queen playing Carol Channing. Are you interested? And I learned a long time ago in this business that when you wanted to do something, you always said, uh, yes. Hello, Margie Morris and Rosa Puzo. Thank you for being here this evening. So they asked me if I would get up and do this number. I went over with the musical director and I learned about 16 bars of the title song, All American Boy. And I did the song, and then they said, we want to cast you in the show. However, 
we have a very, now remember this was off, 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 off Broadway. So they said, which means that I was performing in the basement of some church somewhere. So they said, we want to offer you the job. There's no budget. So we are assuming that you have your own costumes. And I said, well, of course I have my own costumes. And uh, and I'm going to tell you, uh, Glenn Charlo, if you happen to be watching, and if you send me a private message uh, and you send the picture because he's got it, I will post the picture of me wearing the costume uh, that Leola Harlow designed for me. I'm jumping out of my story. So anyway, I I said, yes, of course I have my own costumes. Lie. Uh, and, uh, you know, and I had the job. I ran out and I ran to the nearest payphone. Now, remember in those days, we didn't have cell phones. I didn't even have an answering machine. And I called Leola Harlow and I said, Leola, you're not gonna believe why I'm calling you. She said, meet me at my apartment at 6 p.m. this afternoon. So I showed up at her apartment. Now, mind you, I was 19 years old and some of you may remember, I was a toothpick. I was so thin. She went into her closet and she pulled out a silver lame dress, just the top and a bottom, silver lame with ostrich plumes down the front and around the base of the skirt. And she said, oh my God, this is going to be incredible. And then I had a friend, Michael Bird. I don't know whatever happened to him. I don't know where he is. Uh, he left New York, uh, went back home to Alabama or Tennessee or wherever it was he was from. And I called him up and he was a hairdresser. And he said, meet me and we'll go to 14th Street and we'll find a cheap wig for you. So, and of course, this was the time uh, where Carol Channing was wearing the page boy hair, uh, uh, the wigs. So we went down to 14th Street. We found a cheap wig. I had a costume and I rehearsed and the show opened four weeks later. I came out, I did the title song, All American Boy, and the place went crazy. And it was just an incredible moment for me. And of course I come off stage and I say, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? And the stage manager says, go out and take another bow. Well, of course we didn't have other choruses. We didn't have anything to do. So I came out and the audience is screaming for me to sing the song again. So I did the song a second time and I came off the stage and I went, oh my God, this is gonna make me a star. That's what I was thinking. And I came off stage and after the show that night, the director and the producer and the songwriter for All American Boy came into my dressing room and they congratulated me first of all on the performance. And then they said they were cutting the song from the show because this was not a show about a female impersonator performing as Carol Channing. And if I continued in the show, that's what the show would become about. And that's not what the show was about. So I was out of the show, but I had a costume. And so every year on Halloween, I would dress as Carol Channing and I would hit all the piano bars. And I've talked about this before. I would start out at the Monster. Again, they had a buffet. Sasha, who worked at the front door, uh, the Monster uh, was the first gay bar that I had ever been in. Um, it was a piano bar. Stanley Keeler at the piano. And Stanley, every time I would come in, he would get me up to perform as Carol. Now, most of the time when I went, I would be dressed pretty much like you see me right now, no costumes, nothing. But I got up and on Halloween, I would come in and every time I walked in, they would get me up to do a set as Carol Janning. I would leave there, I would go to Marie's Crisis, I would do a couple of numbers there, leave Marie's Crisis, and then I would go to the original duplex, these were on Grove Street, do a couple of numbers there, leave, go to the Five Oaks where Marie Blake was playing. And I would leave there and then I would go to 88s uh, with Karen Miller at the piano. And then I would leave there and I would go to Don't Tell Mama uh, with uh, Dick Gallagher at the piano. 
And this went on for years that I would do this every Halloween. And it got to the point where people were looking forward to my coming in and performing as Carol Channing. Uh, and, you know, I would come into the, these rooms the rest of the year and I started getting a name for myself. And it was a good name at that. Uh, but they all knew me. And every year people would say, you're coming in on Halloween. And I would say yes. And I would get dressed up. And as the years went on, the makeup got better. The costumes got better. And I would find people who would uh, make uh, costumes for me and everything. And again, this continued to be my Halloween tradition. Then in 1989, John Glines, a uh, wonderful uh, writer, may he rest in peace, he had written a show called Men of Manhattan. And at this point, I'm working at Marie's Crisis Restaurant uh, 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 Bar this many years later. So I'm working and he comes in one night and he says, I've written a show and I've written a part for you. And I don't want to tell you what it is. I don't want you to know anything about it until we do the reading. So even the night of the reading, I was not given the script until moments before that scene in the show. And the character, uh, it's two guys, uh, one guy trying to spice up his relationship so he hires his caterer. I come to the party. I fall asleep, drunk behind the pan, uh, behind uh, the sofa. I jump up and I go, I'm Carl Channing. And I wasn't dressed as Carol, but I went in and out of this character of Carl, doing her voice and mim mimicking her. And when I said, I'm Carl Channing, the entire room burst into this laughter that John Glines wanted. And, but he had also written another role, uh, which I did not read that night, of Ian. I just did this one scene. And then when they decided that this was going to be, oh, Cynthia Bassanet is here. It's so hard to deal with Eastern Standard Time, Pacific Standard Time. It is Halloween. I am so very sorry. All of a sudden, I'm like, <laughs> Alexa, what is a point of having Alexa if she didn't tell me? 6 30 um here she is warning me hi i'm so sorry <laughs> i was telling halloween stories until you got oh, here i'm so sorry That's how are you about it Hello. the fact is you are here now how are you good we're <laughs> i mean everything's backwards it's it's hell on anyone that's dyslexic, I got to tell you. Okay, yeah, I'm not going to blame it on your dyslexia. I'm going to blame it on the fact that this is, we are in Mercury retrograde, which, oh, yes. Reviewing which old in, lessons. Yes. No and movement forward. That's right. And Mercury retrograde is going to be ending on, are you ready for this? Election, Election Day. day. Oh. Election Day. <laughs> But anyway, I was telling these stories. I thank everyone for your patience and everything. And we will, uh, I will finish those stories at another time. The bottom line is that you're here now. Um, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Um, I was telling everyone, I love these sayings in your book. I get up every morning and I, you know, I do morning pages. And then I go to the book. Yeah. And then I start uh, and I uh, go to the next page and I read that quote and I meditate on it. So you're helping me remain civil in this uncivil world that we're living in. How are you? Yeah, you know, it's interesting because so many other authors have done that for me. Uh, Habiz is a, um, a Persian poet from the 16th century, and I read his and meditate, and a Buddhist bought that for me. So I always find it interesting that we are just little capsules of philosophies, you know, and hopefully it's, it's what gives the boundaries to our practice so mm -hmm. that it kind of goes, okay, these are the the rules of the day to uh, live within when you're confronted because we're all confronted all day long. So you can either hide as we're all in quarantine. I can't believe I did it. It's like anything in my life. It's just like doing Santa baby. Everything 
came at exactly the right moment where everything lined up. If I hadn't had the COVID money from Trump, I wouldn't have been able to write the book to say. <sighs> well, I want to begin. I mean, you mentioned that you were um, uh, Santa Baby. You yeah. had, what is it, the number one recording of Santa Baby? Yes, for 20 how did, years. How did that come about? Kind of the same thing that uh, I followed my heart, always my dreams. And instead of investing in IRAs, I wanted to invest in myself and other people. So music was a green product. Mm -hmm. And in 97, <clears throat> I kind of believe that you can't live in the land of what if and I hope someday and yada, 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 you know. You have to embrace the moment. And I'm like, why would you wait to put out a CD for when you're famous? Why not give it to the directors and everyone that's inspiring you at this particular moment to um, put it out there? So Wrigley Scott, Gus Van Sant, all these great directors that I thought it would be an immediate crossover from singing, doing music videos, and then, then doing musicals. I didn't realize that journey would be via refugee camps, via heartbreak, via uh, the UN, via more heartbreak, via moving back over. You know what I mean? Like, and I figured last 2000, when Trump won the last time, I didn't have time to put out a book about why he did. And I wrote, okay, if you just sit down, I'm sure by the end of the year, you will have a book, but I couldn't publish it because I was moving here to Nashville. And somebody said, well, you know, I test marketed it. And a lot of people said double the quote. So I thought if in this time, why don't I see in the, when I came to Nashville, why don't I see if I can double the book? And sure enough, the book finished and it's literally a penny for my thoughts, like one penny per page. And who knows what it helps, but I know how many other people are inspired by my work. And I thought, wow, if this could do what the music did and open people's hearts. And, you know, I'm, well, just, I trying go to back. I... Love. I'm just trying to spread the love. I'm tired of seeing the 99.99% .99 excluded from the solution. And that's all I write, man. Well, I want to go back. I want to. I want to celebrate you, and I want to ask. You know, uh, where are you from originally? Where were you born? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. Uh, you're did a you... Valley girl. You're a Valley girl, but uh, I'm a Southern boy from South Carolina. So yeah. here we are together. Yeah. And, we met yeah. <laughs> and did you? Um, but did you grow up in a theatrical family? Uh, was At your family all. exposed to the arts? No, I mean. My father loved jazz and he loved music and, and my mother was artistic. But um, no, my family drugged me to stop me from doing this. It was a big overcome. This has been a huge overcome. That's why I wrote the book because every day of my life is a challenge. It's never been a given. It's just every day is just, are you kidding? Um, and I thought, if I'm going through this, what the hell is the rest of the world going through? So then that's why I went to see refugees and whatnot. But I just felt that the media was so rigged long before Trump was saying fake news. I've been screaming it because I have an inside perspective that no one seems to want to ask because I'm a girl. And all they care about is what I wear and who it, it can so what is the on. What is the inside perspective? Well, you know, there's one thing to have fake media. That's fine. We grew up hearing stories of Hollywood and they make up this and make up that. And I think it's normal because it's a particular shield and mm -hmm. it protects you and, it, and you understand, oh, that's the character they need me to play. That's fine. It gives you boundaries, discipline. Well, but instead what's happened is the media is so embedded with entertainment that's embedded into you watch the news and if you didn't have that last five minutes talking about Meghan Markle on Disney and across all the networks, maybe we would have heard about COVID that last five minutes of every network nightly news. It's these things that I'm concerned about. And I don't even need to say my own personal battle that they use it for their own whip. You know, I get a three day relay between what I say and do and it's countered in the media. It's like, come on, man, I'm not an indentured servant. 
nor are the people I hire. So if you don't let any new blood in, nothing grows. We're sitting in a vacuum for 20 years that nothing has changed. And we think, uh, and you know how I feel about the celebrity culture, because it goes along with fake news, mm -hmm. fake brands. And I'm the moron that taught one of my exes about branding back a million years ago because I felt actors were not getting the maximum of their employment and employability. So I really tried to teach the idea of branding, what you do, your artistic, because I really, I know I'm rambling, but it is Halloween. <laughs> yes. No, I want to ask you. I made you wait. So I'm like, oh, I'm so sorry. Like I looked at the clock. I'm like, no, it's six. It's Eastern. So. But you saw I that am, I you know, I've done the same thing, so don't even worry about it. The bottom line is that you're here now. So growing up in Los Angeles, yeah. were you, even as a young girl, um, aware of celebrity culture and how Los Angeles is really owned by celebrity culture? I, I think because my older brother was mentally challenged and probably when I see pictures, the only two that exist of me as a little baby... I think I was probably quite cute. And I'm sure that my mother didn't appreciate the attention that probably living in Los Angeles and hearing, oh, your little kid should be, this was a different time in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. So they skedaddled up to Silicon Valley, uh, San Jose. So I was completely, not only was I removed from it, my mother abhors, my mother thinks the Amish are, she's passed, God bless her soul. She thinks the Amish are flashy did she <laughs> hates three things hollywood politics and boobs and i'm kind of all three and not in any particular order so they just want me to stay home and cook all the time which fine that's what i like to do but my outlet was the music so i was allowed that and the discipline of the music saved me i had music in the school and it's always been in a discipline for me and an art form Mm -hmm. So I think what two things navigated me through what you're saying about Los Angeles. I was a single mom from a very early age and I took him to France with me and we had a great life. And then we came back to America of Dan Quayle and <clears throat> we're all the, it's because of us, the, America's failing. And I went from like wonderful men that were just so great and helped me with my son and, and saw that France had a very limited youth culture. So when they saw this little blonde boy speaking fluent French and English and just as sweet as can be, our lives were, and I lived with a, a music person and I was a legal concubine. So we had a great life. And then when I came to America, it's been this angry white male syndrome of what you're seeing in the White House. From the moment my feet touched ground back in Los Angeles, and I came from Silicon Valley, I'm a coder originally. I've been fighting the system um, one way or another for this many years. In what That's way? My image. Go ahead. In what way have you been fighting it? Well, on a personal level, on a activist level, I went to see refugees uh, because I saw their self-determination and they not having a voice. When I lived in France, I lived under terrorism and I lived with a lot of people that helped me because of my son and being disenfranchised. Even though I was a model, a lot of people that befriended me were... Um, having frustrations of their own voice and they too were displaced. So from a very young age and anytime you model and you live in Paris and you fly to London, and you're there for two weeks, you're displaced and mm -hmm. you're kind of at the mercy of the universe or whatever, plus having a child. Um, so they were very lonely times and a lot of the nicest people to me were the ones that really struggled and, had hearts of gold and that's why they were fleeing wherever they used to live. 
Well, I, I want to go back to your childhood for a moment, if you don't mind. Yes. And I want to ask you, you know, what were your aspirations? Did you want to go into the music industry? Did you want to be a model? Did you want to be a writer? Uh, you know, take us back uh, to the five-year-old Cynthia Bassanet. You know, where did you um, want to, where did you picture yourself uh, on this planet? Exactly where I am right now. I love that. I love it. Everything no. that I've achieved and lived, I dreamt. And if there's one thing I wish for other people, because you know my pretty adamant about not drugging our children, um, I'd like to see the whole world living. If my best friends heard me say this, they go, God, there goes, she goes. But I'd like to see the world follow their hearts. We're mm -hmm. so marketed at, manipulated, and fed this and fed that. That's fine. That's the frosting. Great entertainment, Hollywood. That's the frosting. But if you don't have the ability to process it through your soul and your bones to go, <laughs> that's entertainment. When you start to think that's real life. And then, of course, I... Okay, I'll stay off that track, track of reality. TV. No, no, I, you know, I, I'm glad that you're bringing this up because, I mean, that is in line with what this whole book club that I've created is all about. Um, I believe that if more people operated from hope instead of fear, Amen, my it, brother, it would be a completely different world. And I too live my life with hope. I still have a lot of hope. Um, I have a friend, uh, and I quote him on practically every show, and he says, we're all in this together, but we're not in the same boat. Yeah. Now, of course, right now, with this time that we're living in, and with, uh, you know, uh, the pandemic and everything, um, how do you structure your days, and what gets you through each day? Nothing about the pandemic's quarantine has changed my life because that's the way I basically had to live for the last mm -hmm. 20 years since launching online. Mm -hmm. So my life's gone on as if this hasn't happened. I will say that I am thankful to the fact that music installed discipline and my... Um, one of my friends would always say discipline, discipline is your friend and he's a workout you know, strong man guru. And I think that's the key is that on one hand, we're all kind of living in the Truman show. So there's this moment of we're stuck <laughs> up the groundhog day. It's like, Oh my God, the same. So that, and that's going to produce a certain inbreeding and, and whatever. But I think we've needed a reset button. My God, I, I'm not discounting the tragedy of what's going on. But there is a huge disc, um, 2020 in 2020, we've needed an enormous reset button because I don't believe that society changes by celebrities. I believe that it's all of us that have solutions and we've given up our power. I mean, one of the interesting things in the refugee camps, because they live in basically quarantine and have for decades mm -hmm. and their camps are split up in case there is a uh, breakout, a break, um, a disease, it won't pass through the camps and annihilate them. So they understood this decades ago that they need to be separated. They, they're very in advance. So when you realize that there's somebody else out there that has nothing and is standing up and fighting for what's true, that voice needs to be amplified and how many other people out there are not being heard. And it just gets gobbled up by, we won't list the millions of names. You can just look at my Facebook all day. And it's, it's kind of why Google's getting sued right now is what's happened with the entertainment mm -hmm. business that we're just looking at the same people and the algorithms and the facial recognition has gotten so embedded that it's so tainted now that no new life can come in. And that's what Google soon will lose because if you're so embedded that a ma and pa knows that by advertising on Google, their ads will never be seen because the Kardashians have come up with their same CBD product by spying on them. 
um, you know, they're going to go, why am I paying ads to Google? Mm -hmm. So it's so tainted now, Facebook, all these brand, these um, social media companies that we think we trusted that I think they're going to lose the kind of um, hold they once held. <laughs> and I think it might happen to Hollywood because they're having a huge reset because there have been no red carpets. So they can't copy anything nearly. And Disney's been shut. It's made people really question like, wow, I've had it really lucky, but how many artists haven't? Mm -hmm. You know, Hollywood, they've just been scooting along all these decades, ever since our union strike with the commercial strike is what kicked this off. And it all went on to, you know, the 0.0001%. And I was happily part of, but I thought, wait a minute, um, this isn't right. And that's what I fought against all this time as I'm very vocal about. Well, before we run out of time, because we Sorry, will, uh, no, it's quite all right. I want to ask you, yes. what was the deciding factor for you, the light bulb in which you decided to sit down and write this book? Well, that same discipline that you were saying um, in 2017, uh, well, I went back to Los Angeles to wrap up a seven year divorce that turned into three more years. And the same thing, I couldn't really leave the house. And I'm always about not what you can't do, but what you can. And what is being offered to you to look out the window and see the birds, you know, cycling the trees to go off on their, you know, winter escapades. That's what's being offered to you. Take it in. And what was being offered to me was the fact that no one can take away the pen and the paper to write it down. So I thought if every morning I can come up with a quote, by the end of the year, I'll have a book. And I try to start a project in the spring um, and then in the summer, expand, have fun, meet people. In the fall, you reap the rewards of what you planted in the spring. And I think at Christmas time, which is why I do sing Christmas songs, I believe that that's when you share it to everyone. And when people complain and say, oh, Christmas is too long, yaddy, yaddy, yaddy. I think the idea that you look at red, which is love, and green, which is money, no, um, for, you know, 25% of a company's profit, probably 35% now, you know, what's wrong with promoting Christmas? And I don't really look at it like, oh, it's, it's um, religious. I look at it as it's, it's like paying back mankind. It's like just your dues on this earth, you know, we're union. We understand to be part of something bigger than us and that by paying a little in all of us, we will have a better life. And it's something I was raised on being a union daughter. I've walked the picket line myself with my godchildren. I, I hate what's going on right now for all the people unemployed in Broadway. And I just try to do one little part and the next thing seems to lead to the next thing. And here we are talking and I'm so sorry I wasn't late. No, it, it, again, it's okay, it's okay. I wanna ask you, who were the people that inspire you? Uh, well, if I said it would sound like I'm pandering to a particular audience, but if anyone's listened to my speeches, I've always been and walked the path of um, Martin Luther King Jr. meets David Mammoth is kind of how my speeches are in New York. Mm -hmm. And I was born on the same day as Malcolm X and Ho Chi Minh. So when I went through Memphis and whatnot, I really thought, oh my God, you've really come, and now in Nashville, you've really come to the next place where civil rights are being fought and determined and that they've been determined so many times before. And I feel like our civil rights of this era is our intellectual property and all the variances of that. And that's a whole nother topic, but I'm um, blessed to be here. I can't believe it sometimes like 
how it has worked out, but I will tell you every day is painful and it's a big struggle to get up. I think a lot of people deal with depression. Mm -hmm. You have to pick a, a goal larger than yourself. Uh, Ted Turner, he, uh, his father committed suicide you know, yeah. and he admits to have had um, help with medication. I unfortunately am not able to do that because I try to keep a straight so many people ask advice. I try to keep it pure. So it's hard. You have to process the ups and downs. So alcohol is not a good thing for people because what goes up goes down. Um, and I have a lot to say about it. And I think that that's why it's a shame. Like you just said, we need to be broadcasting hope and hope produces that's why progressives are right on because it's progress mm -hmm. and progress is a good thing. You know, why can't a kid that invents how to get rid of the microplastic in the river succeed instead of, instead of the people that are invested in the stock market right. that make money because of the fact that they're invested in a plastic company. It's like, give it up. You've all made so much money give it up. You have lived in a country that has afforded you the ability to make this kind of money. You all need to pitch in. I grew up in the 60s and the 70s and America was great. I grew up before um, <laughs> Governor Reagan came along and my older brother's mentally challenged. So I really understood that we all are handicapped. Some of us wear it on the outside. Some of us wear it on the inside. Everybody's going to fall down at some point everybody's going to wish they had a $10,000 stimulus check mm -hmm. that they could cash in maybe three times in their lifetime to get back up again because they don't belong to a country club. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's, it's not any fun if only the same handful rule. And like you said, they're not coming from a place that makes people happy. Why not be happy? It's so short and our lives are over. That's no one's even thinking of that with this COVID reminder at our door. Knock, knock. <laughs> you know, I don't know. Well, I think of this as a time to pause. Yeah. It's a time for us to really take a moment uh, to appreciate the things that we've had in our lives, the things that we still have in our lives. Um, one of the things that I keep hearing from so many people is I can't wait to have my life back. Well, I've got a big wake up call for all of you. <laughs> this is this your life. Is your life. <laughs> yes and get out there. I, I want to ask you, um, with all the quotes that you have in the book, do you have a favorite quote that sticks out for you? Uh, I always repeat this one. It's never about the actual event, but what it forces one to process, because always in the news, there'll be a big thing, and this, this person will blame that person, and that person will blame that person. I'm like, no, you don't realize the whole point is just to see the general story, the theme, you know, and what we can process from that, because otherwise, why are we here? Right. Why, why, why are we going to college? Why are we reading? Like you said, why are you filling your brain with an interesting quote and then meditating? You know, I will say you're so smart to be doing that. I've been fortunate enough with city fit to have it online doing meditation during lunchtime, 10 hours. If I hadn't done her and fab fit fun, um, her, 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 live your day, start your day with man, um, intention. Mm -hmm. Her little six minutes led me to do the meditation at lunch that then led me to get that book done. Well, so, as I said earlier, I, you know, each day I read a different quote from your book and I meditate on it. And like today, the quote was, life is the journey lived. And it reminded me, it, you know, it's funny, it will trigger a memory or something. Um, years ago, I had a friend who was taking care of an artist. And this artist, his entire apartment was a piece of art. He designed each room as a special haven. To be in. And, and it's interesting because um, uh, this guy, who was a phenomenal artist, uh, just one day dropped dead, just died. No, he wasn't sick. He just died. And my friend who was taking care of him said, I want you to see the apartment. I had never seen the apartment. Yeah, yeah. And I walked into the apartment, Cynthia, and when I walked into the apartment, um, there was a 
can of dog food uh, still in the electric can opener. Um, there was water in the bathtub. The newspaper was open on the sofa. And bills were there in front of him that he was getting ready to pay. And it made me think that life just for that particular moment just stopped still. And as I stood there in that room, I thought about all of this. And seeing that quote today brought back this flood of memories. And, you know, and it is about the journey. And, um, and I, you know, and I know that you were late getting here, but the bottom line is. I was is, the hammock on my balcony going, it must be time soon. Where is Alexa reminding me? And then I'm like, no, it's not Pacific. It's not, it's not central time. It's Eastern standard time. No, <laughs> the bottom line is that you made it here. And uh, oh, my goal yeah. was to talk about your book. And um, uh, we are, believe it or not, at the end of the show. Yes. Um, and I want to say to everybody, um, I, you know, if you enjoyed the show, and I hope you did, please go to my website, which is richardskipper.com, and put your thoughts about the show. That helps to boost me in other markets. Um, and I also end every show by telling you I'm going to go to the fourth person on uh, your friends list and reach out to them and do something nice for them without expecting anything in return. So what I'm going to do is I see some of my friends who have left comments tonight and I'm going to pick a friend and I'm going to send, I'm going to order another copy of the book uh, before uh, it, uh, when I finish this interview and I'm going to send them the copy of the book because it's, it's important that they read it. And the person that I'm going to send it to um, is probably closer to me than anyone else on this list. And uh, for good reason. And she knows who she is. Um, but anyway, Cynthia, I love you. Um, we have, uh, our paths have crossed through cyberspace <gasps> years and years and years, but I we know. finally got a chance to be here. And I'd love to have you come back sometime when we can do a full hour. Would you yeah, do? And I really appreciate, I, I was looking through and I really appreciate that you're highlighting so many authors, uh, women, obviously. And it like, you you've tapped into a theme and, and I'm, I'm really grateful that who knows like this shit just comes out of your brain who knows what, but you can't <laughs> wait. You just have to write it down and and swing the bat man swing the freaking bat that's and right and that's what i really appreciated when i looked at all the other authors that you had interviewed and what they were talking about and you're right man it's hope and it's it's i thank you happy halloween happy halloween oh, um I, I want to let everybody know that I will be back here tomorrow night at seven o'clock with Richard Gazer. And uh, he is in uh, the same time zone that I'm in. So he, <laughs> if he's watching, you have no excuses tomorrow night. I will forgive Cynthia, uh, but Richard be here at seven o'clock tomorrow night. Um, he is a very interesting gentleman. He has his own radio station and I'm very excited to celebrate him tomorrow night. Um, and I want to let everyone know the next full moon is on November 30th. And my guest, uh, and he doesn't have a book to promote, is Dana P. Rowe, R-O-W-E. Look him up, Dana P. Rowe. Uh, and he is probably uh, one of the most upbeat, positive people Aww. that I know on the planet. And I am thrilled to have him. And we now, so need that. Thank you. Now, Thank before you. we sign off, I want to give you the final word. Any message that you want to put out to everyone who's watching uh, to get us through, not only now, but the days ahead. And again, thank you, Cynthia, for being here tonight. Thank you, Richard. And as we go into the holidays, just everybody, just be grateful. It's not as how fast you can go. It's how slow you can go. Just, just embrace every moment. It just slips by so fast. Like, and so many people need our help. And if you're doing okay, reach out to somebody. They shouldn't have to ask. You should be sensitive enough. You know, don't quote, don't blow smoke up and complain about what's going on in government and what's going on and all in the polls. 
get out there and help someone and do it environmentally as you can, please. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Good night. Have Good a great night. evening. Good night, everybody. Make it a better tomorrow. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thank you.